Hello and welcome to the daily newspaper analysis. Today we shall be discussing the newspaper of the 6th of April. Now, this being a Friday, this is the customary yes, no, it's complicated article. And the question for today is that was the Supreme Court right on the anti-atrocities law? The context here is with regards to the Subhash K. Mahajan versus the state of Maharashtra case. Now, in this particular case, the Supreme Court has given some guidelines with regards to the SCST Prevention of Atrocities Act of 1989. Now, as per this, these guidelines, the Supreme Court has given some safeguards against the misuse of this particular act for, uh, for people who are not belonging to the SCST category. Now, what are these safeguards? What are these guidelines? Now, if a complaint is filed under this particular act against a public official, then in that case, before pursuing the complaint, a permission is what is going to be required from the appointing authority of that public official. So that is one safeguard. Another thing is that for a person who is working in the private sector, if a complaint is filed under the SCST Prevention of Atrocities Act, in that case, a permission is what is going to be seeked from the SSP, which is the Senior Superintendent of Police. So what is largely envisaged here is that a preliminary inquiry is what is going to be held before a complaint can be registered under this particular act. In the past, you should know that this act did not allow for anticipatory bail. Now, this provision is something that has been taken away by the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court has said that this provision of not allowing anticipatory bail is not absolute and rather this is dependent on the permission which is to be given by the appointing authority in the case of public official and the SSP in the case of a person working in a private institution. So, these are the safeguards. This is the background of this particular issue. Now, coming to the argument, the first argument is that yes, the Supreme Court's decision of providing these safeguards is a right decision. Now, the first argument here is the concept of equality before law. Now, as we all know that equality before law is a fundamental right under Article 14 of the Constitution. And this is something that even the Supreme Court has cited in this particular judgment. The Supreme Court has said that law is something that is equal for all the citizens. So, it cannot happen that the law is discriminatory against those who are not belonging to the SCST category. And as a result of which, some safeguards is what is definitely warranted for these people. So, that is one decision under which Supreme Court has given it this particular judgment. Another thing is the idea of natural justice. Now, this is an important concept. The author here is saying that this particular safeguard that the Supreme Court has given is a is within the ambit of natural justice because it simply provides a person an opportunity to defend himself in, at a preliminary stage where the complaint is what is filed. Now, this law is a very stringent law and if a complaint is filed against a person, then he is not liable for an anticipatory bail and as a result of which, the complaint itself can be a punishment for that person. So, in that case, it is only a part of natural justice that this person should be given an opportunity to defend, to defend himself and as a result of which this particular safeguard by the Supreme Court is justified. So, that is the argument here. Another argument is with regards to the investigating officers. Now, often it has been said, especially by people belonging to the SCST category, they say that whenever they file a complaint under this Act of Prevention of Atrocities Act of 1989, the investigating officers are reluctant to file a particular complaint. And as a result of which, such kind of safeguards given by the Supreme Court would further make the issue complicated and further the investigating officers will not file a complaint whenever the SCST category people are complaining for an atrocity which has been done on them. Now, in this context, the author here is advocating that if the issue is with regards to the investigating officers, then a, a, a particular clause is what should be added to the present law where action is what is going to be taken against the investigating officer if they are not going to register the complaint that is filed rather than punish innocent people or rather than align for misuse of this particular act. So that is something that this particular argument has in this set of argument the author has analyzed. So this is something that is important. Another thing which has been analyzed here is with regards to the nationwide protest which has happened. Now the author here is criticizing the protest which has been done. This protest is what was held by the people belonging to the SCST category. They have felt that the, the safeguards that were given to them have been diluted by the Supreme Court and they held a nationwide protest. This protest was a violent one. It caused a lot of disruption and a property worth crores of rupees is something that was damaged. Now, if you all know that in the past we had discussed about the farmers protest which took place in Maharashtra where the farmers carried out a silent march from Nasik to Mumbai. Now, in that context, the author is analyzing that that protest was a very peaceful one and this protest is a very ruckus one. So, that is one criticism which he has levied in this set of argument. 
Another is thing which has been analyzed is the case of data. Now some data is what has been given. This is something that is important also and you can use it in your answers. Now what has been analyzed here is that approximately 40,000 cases is what is filed each year under the SCST Prevention of Atrocities Act. There is a range of 40 to 50,000. So this is something that you should know. Which means that approximately in one hour, six atrocities is something that is taking place as per the complaints that are filed. Of all these complaints, 77% of the cases, charge sheet is what is filed by the police. But even after the 77% of the cases where charge sheet is filed, their conviction rate is only 15 to 20%. So this clearly shows that the conviction rate is very low in this, in this particular issue. And it is on this basis that the Supreme Court has given these safeguards. Because if the conviction rate is low, then this proves that large number of cases are largely malified and they are generally done to harass people. And this is a misuse of this particular act. So that is something that has been analyzed here. Another issue which has been discussed is with regards to the rural and urban areas. Now the author here is discussing that definitely in urban areas, caste identities are something that are blurred compared to rural areas where caste identity, identities are something that are very deeply entrenched. So the issue here is that in rural areas, any form of argument or for that matter, any form, form of conflict is often given a caste angle and the uh, the, pro the prospect of misuse of this particular act of 1989 is something that is very high in the rural areas. And so such kind of safeguards is something that was definitely warranted. So these are the set of arguments which prove that yes, the Supreme Court's decision are right. But now coming to the next set of argument which says that no, the Supreme Court's decision is not acceptable. The first argument here is with regards to neutralizing the act. Now the author here is saying that these safeguards which the Supreme Court has given has neutralized the effect of the act of the SCST Prevention of Atrocities Act of 1989 and largely the teeth out of this act is something that has been taken the act has been rendered useless now so that is the first criticism another issue is with regards to the reluctance in implementation now here the author is saying that generally it is seen that the government is reluctant in providing safeguards to the SCST community this can be proven from the fact that despite the fact that this act came into existence in the existence in the year 1989 it was only implemented six years later in the year 1995 so already when the executive has such delays in implementation already the executive is not very protective of the SCST then how is it that the safe Supreme court has given further powers to the executive and it has further diluted the provisions of this act so that is one analysis which has been made another issue here is with regards to the ground reality now the author here is saying that the ground reality is that the poor people of the SCST category are hardly empowered to file any complaint this is largely because they are already fearing harassment by public officials and to avoid this harassment, they hardly file any complaint whenever an atrocity is done on them. Even the minor amount of complaints which they are filing is after being pressurized or after being motivated by the civil society or for that matter pressure groups. Now, after these particular safeguards, the, the scope for harassment of these poor people is something that is going to be increased and as a result of which they are going to be further debtored in reporting any atrocity which is done on them. So this is a major step back in reporting of crimes against the SCSTs. So that is one important analysis. Another thing which is very important here is that uh, and some other cases is what has been discussed. Now this is a landmark case that you should know. This is the Kherlanji case. This was a case, this, this is known as the Kherlanji massacre. This took place in the year 2006 where several scheduled caste citizens, citizens belonging to the scheduled caste, scheduled castes were killed in this particular massacre and this largely took place in Maharashtra and they were killed by the dominant Kunbi caste in that particular region. So this particular case is what has been highlighted here that such kind of cases do exist in the past and even now the Una violence in Gujarat is something that you can quote. Also there are number of cases of Dalit violence which are rising in the country. So in that context it can be said that when violence is something that is rising against the vulnerable scheduled caste and scheduled tribe communities then how is it that the Supreme Court has further weakened laws which are protecting them. So that is one issue which is been raised.
Another issue is that of judicial activism. Now, definitely this this law, the safeguards are something that have not come from the parliament and these have come from directly from the judiciary. So definitely this is a case of judicial legislation and judicial activism. So as a result of which it has been criticized. Another issue is with regards to fundamental rights. Now here you should know that the Supreme Court while giving these safeguards has talked about the fundamental rights under Article 14 and under Article 21. Under Article 14 which is equality before law, law is something that we have discussed. Also under 20, Article 21 the Supreme Court has said that every individual has a right to life and liberty and as a result of which these kind of laws which are taking away the liberty of individuals is something that need to be curbed but this set of argument is saying that if there are fundamental rights like 14 and 21 then there is also a fundamental right under article 17 which abolishes untouchability so the supreme court should have taken cognizance of this particular fundamental right also and it should have given protection to the vulnerable scheduled caste and scheduled tribe category. So that is one important analysis. Another criticism that has been made by the author here is with regards to the preliminary committee. Now this idea of a preliminary committee in itself is something that is flawed. This is because in case of a public uh, public servant the, the preliminary committee shall comprise of the appointing authority and in the case of a private uh, a person working in the private sector the preliminary committee shall be comprising of the ssp now both the public appointing authority as well as the ssp are executive functionaries and what is the legitimacy of the fact that these people will act in, uh, transparently or for that matter will act in an unbiased manner so this is one criticism which has been highlighted here that the preliminary committee should not be given these powers because these people are not entitled to these this kind of huge power which has been given to them by the supreme court so that is one important analysis here another thing is the third set of argument with regards to the it's complicated set of arguments now this clearly says that it is very difficult to decide whether or not the de decision taken by the supreme court is just Okay. Now, the first argument here is with regards to discrimination versus abuse. Now, here the author is saying that this, it was for the Supreme Court to decide whether this act it should be given in the favor of the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribe who are facing a problem of discrimination or it should have been in the favor of innocent citizens who were against whom this particular act was being misused or it was being abused. So, that is one crucial question which came before the Supreme Court. But the issue here is that the Supreme Court has taken discrimination against scheduled caste and scheduled tribe as an exception and the abuse of this particular act as a rule or as a norm. And this is what has been criticized against this particular judgment by the Supreme Court because a reverse is what is true. Misuse of this act is something that is an exception and discrimination against these communities is something that is a norm in the society. So a reverse analysis is what has been done by the Supreme Court and that is one criticism. And this is also being called as a reverse discrimination because a discrimination is what is being done by the already discriminated society, uh, people in the community that is the SC and ST category. So that is something that has been analyzed here. Another thing is with regards to the idea of extraordinary discrimination. Now, here the argument is that the discrimination against the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribe in our country is somehow an extraordinary form of discrimination. It is something that is as, as a part of the culture itself in India and these kind of discrimination is deeply entrenched in the society. So, if this discrimination was an extraordinary one, then definitely the protection should have been an extraordinary one and it is in this this light that this particular act of 1989 the spirit of this act was to prevent this to provide for an extraordinary legislation to curb this extraordinary discrimination but the spirit of this law is something that the supreme court has failed to acknowledge and as a result of which this is something that has been taken away by the supreme court and that is one criticism here another thing which has been analyzed in this set of argument is the idea of inbuilt provisions now, something that has been proposed was that there should be some inbuilt provision within the SCST Act of 1989 itself, which would talk about the misuse of this act. And it would state that if this act, if, if a false complaint is what is filed against a person, then definitely it is going to lead to some retaliatory impacts. And instead of this, 
instead of allowing for this idea of inbuilt provisions within this act the supreme court has taken away the, the powers of this particular act and it has rendered this act ineffective so that is something that the author here is analyzing that instead of taking away the the spirit of this particular act it should have been better if the supreme court would have allowed for some inbuilt provisions within this act so this is the entire analysis of this issue this issue is going to be an important issue this is an important development so that is going to be the relevance coming to the next article skill india urgently needs reforms now this is one of the most important articles that i have come across this is an all encompassing article on skill india itself the context is with regards to skill india vis-a-vis -vis the demographic dividend of india now demographic dividend simply means that the youth the population of the youth in india is at its maximum it is ballooning so it is an opportunity for india it is a double-edged sword where one on one hand it could be an opportunity where india can use the youth power to increase its development or on the contrary if india fails to utilize the youth then definitely it is going to be a huge state of distress within the country so that is something that has been analyzed another thing is with with regards to the background which you should know first and foremost you should know about the skill india program itself now the skill india program was something that was launched in the year 2015 and it had an aim to train approximately 40 crore people by the year 2022 so this is something that you should know Another thing that is important is that it is under the Skill India program that several schemes or several programs exist. For example, the National Skill Development Mission or the National Policy for Development and Entrepreneurship 2015 or the Pradhan Mantri Koshal Vikas Yojana or the Skill Loan uh, Scheme. All of these schemes are something that are under the Skill India program itself. Another thing that you should know in the background aspect is about a committee. The com name of the committee is the Sharda Prasad Committee. So this is something that is important. The Sharda Prasad Committee. This was a committee that was formed in the year 2016. And this was largely formed to recommend to the government upon the improvement of Skill India. A report was what was given by this committee. And this editorial is largely an analysis of the recommendations of the Sharda Prasad Committee report. So that is something that you need to know. Now coming to the issues which have been discussed. The first issue is with regards to skill india now here the goals of skill india is what has been discussed there are two goals of skill india one goal is to provide the, is to meet the employer's need of skilled labor that means the industries that are going to come in india the employer aspect is what has been discussed that the industries that are going to come to india they should get a skilled workforce in india so that is one aspect one goal the second goal is with regards to the youth in india that the youth should be trained they should be made skilled so that they can be gainfully employed and they can get a good livelihood so that is the these are the twin goals with regards to skill india another thing which has been analyzed is with regards to the vocational education training system now this is an important analysis here you need to know that the vocational education training system means that vocational training should be linked with education now here the author is saying that largely there is a, often it, there's a mindset in India that vocational training is something that is not to be integrated with education and it is for those people who are who are not pursuing the education or who, for, for whom there is a gap within education but this is something this that which is a wrong mindset and vocational training is something that needs to be inculcated or something that needs to be synergized with education system within the country and this is one important link which has been as established and advocated here another thing is with regards to shifting the mindset of the people now in india vocational training is something that is looked down upon in india the mindset of the people is something that of education oriented even if that education is not going to result in gainful employment for example even in engineering degrees we are seeing we are seeing an all number of doctors who are unemployed and for that matter several graduates who are be who are unemployed so in india the culture is that at present, there is a huge amount of educated, unemployed youth in the country. This is a model which is very much different from China. Now, in China, what happens is that vocational education is given a lot of pre preference. Vocational training is something that is given a lot of preference. And an option is what is provided that after the ninth grade, a person can directly go in for vocational training. He can go into vocational training schools. This is something that is further shifts to vocational training colleges and this is further this further goes to vocational training university so there is a pro proper structure which is established in china and this is a model which even india should have used but this is a model that at present india is not using because of the mindset of people in china approximately half of the population of youth 
directly after the ninth grade goes into vocational training and as a result of which they are skilled and they are gainfully employed and this is something that has not happened in india so that is one important analysis another thing which has been analyzed is with regards to the engagement with employers now employers have a major role to play in skill india program and this is something that should take place at all levels for example at the voluntary uh, at the vocational training programs at the vocational education training programs the employers should be linked with the ministries which are providing training to the youth of india so this is a kind of a uh, environment which should be established where the employers are directly linked with the training institution so that they can clearly establish and state the kind of skilled workforce that they want so that is one important analysis which has been made another important analysis is with regards to the realization of human potential now for this what is required is that the courses for skill skilling india should be aligned with the, to the courses of international standards so that the skilled labor or the skilled workforce force from india can get gainful employment in foreign countries so that is something that is important also the skilling process should be a lifelong process you should know here that india at present is exposed to a lot of job losses so in that case what is important is that skills are something that are continuously learned and for this what is going to be important is that the human potential is something that is developed and which would require basic learning programs for example basic reading basic writing arithmetic skills all of this will ensure that newer skills are something that people can continuously learn to adjust to the changing and dynamic environment of today so that is something that has been analyzed with regards to the real realization of human potential another issue is with regards to the structure of skilled programs now the structure should be such that the national skill qualification framework had advocated this is something that you should know that the national skill quality framework has advocated for a structure according to this there should be not more than 450 courses which should be allowed for skilling people this is primarily because a course which can provide employment is a course which should be allowed rather than simply courses just to increase the number so that is something that is important another thing which has been analyzed here is that the vocational training program should last for at least one year at present what is being seen is that often vocational training programs are for for a few months only and this is not something that is resulting in effective skilling of people so a minimum of one year is what should be followed and this should have a compulsory internship period and if this is done only then will the skilling be effective so that is something that has been analyzed here another issue is the issue of regulation now a case of ipis is what has been discussed in this context the editorial discusses that how the quality council of india had failed to provide regulation with regards to the itis now what has happened is that because of poor regulation there has been an increase in the industrial training institutes from approximately 2000 to now 11000 of such institutes which are providing poor quality training and as a result of which this entire program is something that has failed and as a result of which what is vital that these newer skilling programs should have effective regulation so that they do not face the challenges which these itis are at present facing so that is something that has been analyzed another issue is with regards to a unification system now what has been analyzed here is that at present approximately 17 ministries are carrying out skill skilling programs for the youth now here the editorial is making a case that these programs are something that should not take place in silos rather these programs should be integrated with each other so that all the ministries can learn from each other's experience and they can learn from each other's mistakes so this unified system of training is something that is going to be better than individual programs of training so this is something that is important another thing that has been analyzed is the role of private sector now indeed the private sector has a huge role to play in skilling the youth of the country and especially a model is what has been given this is the reimbursement model and this is an important model now according to this model if a private organized sector is carrying out skilling of its workforce in that case the sum that the money that is being spent for skilling is something that should be reimbursed this will ensure that at least in the organized sector the workforce that is working is a skilled and up to date workforce so it is in this context that this editorial is proposing this reimbursement model this is an important model another thing which is important is with regards to data now here the editorial is criticizing that the government is lacking adequate data for ensuring that the skill india program is successful it is important that the government should have adequate data about what is the demand of the private sector what is the demand of the industry and as a result of which 
it is important that a survey is what is conducted and the editorial here is advocating that a survey should be conducted by the NSSO and this survey is something that should be done every five years and it should update the government about the demands of the industry and it is based on these demands that programs should be de designed for skilling the youth of the country. So this is something that has been analyzed here. Another important analysis is with regards to the evidence-based policy making. This is also a keyword and it is primarily for this reason that I have included it. Now, the policy making of the government for skilling the youth of the country should be an evidence-based one, which we can also be concluded from this previous discussion of data in this regard. So, definitely adequate data is what should be required. Evidence is what should be studied and based on that, policy making and designing of programs is what should be done. Another very important analysis is with regards to the sector skill councils. Now, this particular Sharta Prasad committee has also advocated for rationalizing of the sector skill councils. Now, first and foremost, you need to understand that what are sector skill councils. Now, sector skill councils are simply employer bodies, which means that if employment is to be given in the power sector, if skilling is what is to be given in the power sector, skilling programs are what are training the youth in for accommodating them in the power industry, then the employers of this particular sector will comp will comprise of a particular sector skill council. So like this, there are approximately 39 sector skill councils in India, comprising of different sectors of industry. So this Sharda Prasad committee has now recommended that it is these SSCs which need to be rationalized and the number should be brought down to approximately 21. This is what has been advocated by the committee. You should know that in developed countries like in Australia, the SSC numbers is that is the sector skill councils are six only. So definitely there is a case for decreasing the number of the sector skill council so that there is better harmony, there is better linkages between different industries. So that is something that has been analyzed. Another important analysis which has been given, which is also the way forward, is that India has the potential to become the world's skill capital. And it is in this spirit that the government should or channelize all its effort and one important line is what has been given that effort should be made by the government to prevent that another generation loses its dreams so this is something that you you too can replicate in your answer so this is something that is important this entire editorial is very important because it gives an in-depth analysis of the skill india program which is an ambitious program of the government and a question anytime can be expected in upsc so that is the relevance Coming to the next article, consent is crucial. Now, the context here is with regards to the data leak by Facebook to the Cambridge Analytica. The background is something that I will not delve into because we have discussed it in the past. So, coming directly to the issues, the first issue is that of importance of data and data science. Now, this is something that has been analyzed in this editorial that with the importance, with the rising amounts of data, data and data science is something that has become very important. So, this is something that you too can quote. Wherever we have to discuss about innovation, there too we can discuss that this new science is what is developing is the data science. So, that is something that is important. Another thing that is important with regards to India is that in this particular case of Cambridge Analytics, Accusation is what is being made that it is Prime Minister Narendra Modi's app as well as the Congress Party apps which have given unauthorized data to the uh, to the Cambridge Analytica. So this is something that is a newer development with regards to India. This is important. Another important analysis which has been given is with regards to this age being a digital age. Now some some uh, uh, figures is what has been given. According to the IBM, 90% of the data that, that the world has, has been generated in the past two years itself. So you can see the, the growth in the data, which clearly proves that definitely this is the digital age. So that is something that is important. Now, it is for these two points that primarily I have taken this particular editorial for discussion. discussion. The first point is the pros for democracy. Now, this is something that is very important because it is rarely that you will find that what are the pros of these, this data data for democracy. Now, the pros for democracy are that first and foremost, the political parties can understand the voter behavior. They can reach out to the voters more effectively. They can get a feedback from the electorate and they can use it in creating their manifestos. They can use this data and create in formulating policies and for that matter, even in selecting the candidates. So this kind of data, if political parties are gaining, then it indeed has some pros for the democracy. And this is how you, you should also write in your answers because this brings about a de novo understanding. So that is something that is the utility here. This is something that will allow and in ushering of a more transparent and a participatory democracy. So that is the pros of this data revolution in 
the democracy and for the political party so that is the pros aspect now coming to the cons for democracy now the cons here are that it can turn our elections into a marketing campaign and this is something that is being feared has happened in the u.s election itself but a question that needs to be raised is in this context is that this idea of elections being a marketing campaign isn't it already true at present also because to some extent even today in the age of print and electronic media marketing is something that is done by political parties and indeed elections can be to some extent called as a marketing campaign so this is something that cannot be exclusively criticized to social media only but this is something that does exist yes social media will allow and this particular case of cambridge analytica allows further worsening of the situation but this to an extent does exist so this is one analysis which has been made and the final analysis is which we have been discussing in the past also that definitely india is in the need of data protection and a data privacy law so that is the conclusion here now with this we finish today's discussion i thank you all for watching and i hope to see you tomorrow